Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Two Foot Attack podcast. I'm your host, Aris Matakos, and we are here again for another week of speaking about football from, I say around the world, mainly from Europe and Australia, and there's going to be a lot of Australian football talk, I'll tell you that right now. Um, I don't know I don't know exactly what the title is going to be for this, or what the thumbnail is going to include, but I can tell you right now there's going to be a lot of Australian football conversation, and I'm, I'm going to go as far as saying Australian football rant. Um, because for those who have been in the, or for those who have, for those who are on Twitter, you know exactly what I'm going to speak about. For those who have kept this semi eye on the, on the news around Australian football so far this week, uh, this weekend, you know, we're going back to the old ways and we are getting into real, real dark territory. So, um, I'll be giving my two cents on that. I've really refrained from commenting, especially on socials. I didn't really comment. I didn't really even comment on the, on, on, um, Victory's game either because, my mind was kind of not obviously I've annoyed at victory that victory lost and maybe we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um because fucking season's done. Great. Um But yeah, there's a lot to speak about. But anyway, before we get there, let's speak about some enjoyment, happy times. How's how is everyone? I hope everyone is I hope everyone is well. I hope everyone is hope everyone is doing okay. Life can be a little bit life can be a little bit of a bitch sometimes. Hopefully um this forty five minutes gives you some light light entertainment. Um and I hope everyone's doing well otherwise. Uh, uni has started today for me, so oh, I'm back in the swing of things big time. Um, three days at university, which will be awesome. I'm thrilled, as you could probably tell by the very, very little to no sarcasm in my voice. I'm thrilled. Um, but in all, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, it's good to get to re- get good to get the routine back. Um, and obviously, it's good to you know, mingle and do some stuff and learn and stuff, which is always good. Um, but yes, apart from that, same old, same old. Watch Chelsea um, the other morning, draw to Brentford. Um, really interesting strategy from um, Richard Pochettino, starting three centre-backs to um, to really help um, aerially, uh, which is a good tactic, um, only to then concede two goals from crosses. So, plan work to treat, <laughs> plan work to treat, Richard. That's um, awesome. Thanks, bro. Um, I'm sure, I probably should have touched on that when we speak on the on the actual run sheet, but I digress. Um, but yeah, apart from that, can't complain. Ticking, ticking along nicely. All right, what is there to speak about this week? I should we just let, let's let's just start off with um, the run sheet. Actually, before we do, I need to plug. Make sure you subscribe to Two Foot Like a Podcast on YouTube. In, on YouTube, just, uh, subscribe, like, follow, share, all the good stuff. And then, of course, all, all the um, socials, all the audio platforms. I plug them to death. They're in the description. All my social links are in the description as well. So check me. Check me out. Not like that. <laughs> um, check out the socials and what I do otherwise. If you like Australian rules football, I cover a lot of that as well. So um, you can tell I'm Aussie. Um, but yeah, what are we going to speak about today? I just want to do like not a lot of actual things happened, especially in the Premier League and around Europe. So um, speak on the, just going to speak about the Prem, wrap it up, speak about a couple of players, which I thought was pretty good, speak about some storylines that happened in the lower leagues, which I thought were pretty interesting. Um, and then I feel like the majority of this episode will be about what happened over the weekend in regards to the A-League because there is just a lot of, a lot of, unfortunate situations that are happening with the A-League at the moment um, and things that we can't afford right now. Um, I say right now, we probably can never afford, but especially right now in this time of um, turbulence. Let's call it turbulence. Let's be fair and call it turbulence. And also for those playing along at home, I am wearing a retro Benfica kit. Um, It is from 2001-2002 for those playing along at home. Um, This is actually a funny story about this kit. So when I went to Perth, I'm digressing, but I don't care. Um, When I went to Perth, I... um, Bought this kit at a at the at a the at um where did I buy this one from? This one I bought from the kit dealer in Perth, brilliant shop. Um, and that night was the cup final. We went to the casino to watch the cup final, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna wear the Benfica kit that I bought. It's gonna be great. Um, and then I quickly realised when I got there, this is red. Um, and I support the blue team. And they're versing the red team. So it would have been really weird looking at it from like an angle where you couldn't see the badge. That this like guy wearing red is very, very upset when Virgil van Dijk scored the winner. Um, I also had this Scottish guy come up to me and 
starts speaking to me about the Benfica's Europa League game against Rangers, which I thought was hilarious because I didn't, I actually forgot that they were that they were um, drawn together until I spoke, told my mate about it, and he goes, "You know they're playing in the Europa League." Go, oh my god, yeah, they are too. That makes a lot more sense. That it wasn't just some random Scottish guy coming up and talking to me about Rangers for for like a minute, which was quite funny. Um, but I'm digressing. As always, maybe I should come on every every week and tell a story about this shirt. Maybe, um, maybe not. Maybe that's an extension of the podcast. I'm digressing. Okay, let's let's go. Let's keep things off. Um, I want to just touch on the prem briefly. As I said briefly. We'll just keep things off with just broad Premier League discussion. Of course, all uh, of course. Um, in the wake of the of the cup final, Chelsea played drew to all. Like I said, um, it was a glorious glorious game with um players missing chances. Abundantly, um, Brentford probably should have won. Um, if we're being honest, they hit the post twice. They hit the post twice. They had more XG. Um, it was same amount of big chances, but I think the quality of the non-big chances probably just fell Brentford's way. Um, as they get very, very near points, as they just are scraping, th- as they're scraping through the middle kind of portion of the season, as they're fl- flickering towards relegation. Um. Yeah, Nicholas Jackson actually scored a really good header. Ja- Nicholas Jackson's first goal was actually really good, and it was really surprising because I say surprising. It's the Alvaro Morata syndrome, where strikers like Nicholas Jackson, when they think, that's when they get, that's when they get kind of, um, all over the joint. When it's just instinctive, cross header goal, that's kind of where he does his best work. I think um, the more he needs to think about it, and the more that more time he has on the ball, he kind of rushes and kind of like gets into his own head a little bit. So um, it was actually a really good goal, and obviously this this year um, has made up for two very very or I say two. He was okay against Bradford. The game against Leeds, he was average, and the game against Liverpool, I thought it was poor. He was fine. Um, so he made up for two pretty underwhelming performances with a goal, much needed goal, and um, yeah, um, and. Um, yeah, yeah, and we saw with the overhead kick. Just okay then. Um, you do that, and then obviously the first goal as well came from came from a um a, a loose ball header cross into the box that Chelsea couldn't clear, and this I see was too slow to react. So, um, yeah, a lot of a uh, weird a weird game for Chelsea. Really bizarre, really really bizarre. But like, what more can you? What more can you say for that? Um, the Manchester derby happens. City won three one. Uh, Rashford scored a fucking peach of a goal. Christ, that was a that was a that was a strike. That was a strike, and that that is that is Marcus Rashford at his best, really, when he's attacked, when he's like direct, using his pace, using his power in his legs and in his core, driving forward, and then just bang, just no no questions asked, just bang, top corner. Really good goal, and but United couldn't really hold on from there. It was it was like it was I would say a matter of time. Yeah, it was definitely a matter of time of just United praying to God that they nothing happened. I thought the team that they lined up with was probably cognizant of that in a sense because obviously starting three centre halves, Casemiro, um, Delo probably wasn't as advanced as what he potentially would have liked to have been like this game, um, and of course McTominay as well being. One of the advanced midfielders, if you want to use it, if you want to call him that, um, his kind of profile is a little bit more defensive. Um, well, he's at least been kind of nurtured into a little bit more of a defensive profile. So he would have helped out defensively. It was really like seven, eight men behind the ball at times with like Rashford, Garnacho, and kind of Bruno was Bruno was the fulcrum and Garnacho and Rashford as the outlets um, at times, which I don't, I actually didn't think was going to work in the long term, and it didn't when Phil Foden. Um, Found the breakthrough just before the hour mark, and then it scored what the winner technically in the 80th minute before um Erling Haaland put the put the game away in the 91st minute. Phil Foden, um, I'm so wrong about Phil Phil Foden. I am so wrong about Phil Foden. Um, a lot of people, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I ever said this on this podcast, probably for good reason. But um, when Mason Mount was doing his thing for for Chelsea and Phil Foden was still like a bench player for for Man City and stuff. Um, I was very much on the Mason Mount is better than Phil Foden train, um, which is quite clearly just uh, wrong, <laughs> just quite clearly wrong, which is um, which is quite funny in hindsight considering Mount hasn't really done a lot, if anything, this season and has had a really turbulent time over the last kind of 14 months, um, 12, 12 months, call it 12 months. Um, 
whereas Phil Foden has kind of just gone from strength to strength, it feels like, um, especially in the back end of last year where he was really kind of crucial for, the, um, obviously, like in the back end of last year and, and towards last year as well, he started to become a little bit more crucial for them in this season. I think he's got, what, 18 goals and 18 GAs in, in 22 appearances or something like that. Yeah, 17, uh, like 11 goals, 7 assists. Um, 11 goals, 7 assists, 18 um, GA in, in 27 games. He's He's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, I've heard Shia City could be player of the year. Look, I don't know if he, I don't know if he's player of the year level. Like I don't like I really don't know if he's player of the year level. But I mean, he's an extremely talented footballer. Um, definitely proved me wrong on multiple occasions. And he just has that. He just has the ability to do a lot with the ball. He's very unpredictable. Obviously, can cut it. Can go outside, can cut inside, has a ball-striking ability to die for, right? And, um, yeah, he's really proved a lot of people wrong because he was always on the fringes, could never really quite break through, and you think with City spending that they would just buy better players than him in his position, he wouldn't really get a chance. But he's kind of become undeniable you know, over the last kind of 12 months. He just has been knocking down the door, knocking down the door, and now you can't not... I mean, you can't not start him at the Euros, that's for sure. Like, he has to start on that left-hand side. Um, and I think any debate with any other young English kind of midfielder or a winger has kind of been put to bed because he's he's definitely within player of the year conversations. Will he win it? Probably not, but I think he's I think he's definitely there in the conversation. Um, and he's a superbly talented footballer. Like it's watching him play is the light. Um, and it, it's one of the he's a he's a kind of a very much a different player than what a lot of Pep's players are because he's very direct. He's very flamboyant. Kind of. That plays the game at his own pace, a little bit like Jeremy Doku in a sense, um, with his directness and his speed and his ability to weave in and out of players and his agility and his very good uh, close control. So, um, yeah, no, Phil Foden has been has been great, has been really really good um, over the last couple of, over the last couple of months in particular, especially this season. Scored two, um, scored two as well, obviously um, against against Boyhood Club, scoring two against the childhood rival. Doesn't get much better than that, does it? Does not get much better than that. So yeah, fair play to him. Obviously, Doku on the other side didn't really play all that well. He got subbed off just on the hour mark. Um, but apart from that, City were pretty flawless. Um, were pretty flawless. It took a while for them to finally break down United, but I think it was just a matter of time. Especially, I it was it, as much as the as much as the goal did them wonders, United because it gave them like a little bit of something in the game. It is a little bit counterproductive at times because I didn't think Ten Hag was kind of setting up to get that early goal. He was kind of just like waiting to grind the game out and try and pinch one later on than early on, if that makes sense. But it's a double-edged sword at the end of the day, so it's a double-edged sword at the end of the day. So um, I guess it's just one of those things. Um, so that happens. If we're going to Liverpool now, very, very briefly, they won in the 99th minute. Darwin Nunes glancing a header ever so faintly, but, but he's got enough contact onto it to guide it into the back post. It was a... Um, Alexis McAllister cross Nunes off the bench scoring 99th minute a lot of controversy around the time a lot of controversy around not giving the ball back look it's a gamesmanship it's a gamesmanship of football at the end of the day and I think um, I was having this conversation with an Arsenal supporter actually um, not long uh, the other day um, yesterday at the time of recording and he, he likened it to what Arsenal were doing last year just scraping by results and I don't mind that comparison I really don't mind that comparison but I also think Liverpool, if you are going to compare them to my Arsenal, I think Liverpool just have that little bit more in the tank. Maybe it's a reputation thing. Maybe it's a personnel thing. But I just feel like there's something there that just gives them that extra. They that just gives them that extra kind of oomph to go for it um, and, and to really sustain it. Obviously, the the Klopp factor as well is something that's very prominent and poignant regarding their season obviously the league cup is one of four trophies that they're aiming to tick off um obviously the last one they went for the quadruple they they only ended up with the two domestic trophies which is actually pretty funny um so the league cup ticked off they're still in the fa cup i'm like i'm pretty sure right um yeah they got united in the fa cup which would be interesting and um of course the europa league so i'm sure clubs are dying to win that um but yeah no liverpool just did what they needed to do, got the job done, and I also think it would say, um, I also think it's a not monumental moment in their season in a way, but to be able to rebound and win after after a cup final win, I thought I think is very impressive because that game took. I know I know the squad was heavily not heavily rotated, but rotated enough to the point where not a lot of players were the same. Like Gakpo didn't play in the final, McAllister didn't play in the final. Um, 
did Diaz? I think Diaz did play in the final. Um, yeah, he did play in the final. He played all 120 minutes. You're right. So, obviously, Sabozola didn't play. Um, Nunes didn't play. They both came off the bench. So, I think the fact that their squad was able to go again really quickly after the League Cup final in, in the league. Um, obviously, they had the FA Cup game in midweek, but who cares about that? That was against Southampton. Um I think he's very. I think he's very impressive. I think he's definitely very impressive. I mean, yeah, when you look at the team that they played midweek, it was um, Joe Gomez, it was Joe Gomez, Cody Gakpo, um, Van Dijk, and Simicas with a bunch of primary school children um, that Chelsea couldn't beat in a League Cup final. So I can sit here and pot shot them all I want, but my team couldn't beat them, and my team got got embarrassed by them on the biggest stage, which is exactly what you want. Um, yeah. Terrific, but yeah, no, they um, th- th- they won. Good, congratulations, Liverpool. Um, but yeah, apart from that, Prem, I just think that's that's pretty much it. Arsenal play tomorrow morning at the time of recording, so that game would have already happened by the time this episode is released. Liverpool currently sit a point clear. If Arsenal win, they will be one point. They'll be two points behind Liverpool. Um, pretty much a three horse race right now, especially if Arsenal do get that to do, do get that win against Sheffield United, um, who are languaging at the bottom of the table. So I think they will be all but not all but done. But if they're gonna survive, they need this. They need a point at least. Um, Villa and Tottenham are basically in that kind of battle for for the fourth place. I don't think United showed anything to me in that derby that they were gonna challenge for it. I don't think they're gonna get there. Um, Newcastle, I feel like. Their score is just too depleted. Brighton, in a similar vein, I just don't think they're there yet. And then anyone below Brighton, I don't think is within a chance. And Chelsea are very, very much included in that. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting. I really want this to be a close competitive title race. I really do, because it means more games will be interesting. It's, it means more games will be interesting. It means more... Um, it means more games will be interesting. It means more things will happen. And... Um, yeah, it means more games will be interesting. It means more things to talk about, and it means more things could happen, which twist and turn the league either way. So there you go. Uh, before we move on to Australian to Australian football chat, I want to take your attention to lower down in the um, football pyramid and speak about a game between AFC Wimbledon and MK Dons, um, in which AFC Wimbledon won one nil with a. Ronan Curtis, 94th minute goal. Now, I'm not going to speak about the game because I didn't watch it, obviously. Um, but for those who know the history, um, for those who know the history, for those who are familiar with the AFC Wimbledon and MK Dons history, what MK Dons were, what they are now, what AFC Wimbledon were, what they are now. If, if you don't know, do your research. I'm not going to sit here and explain it. I'm not going to give a tell there. I haven't bothered. Um, it, it, it's, we, we, we sit here for the longest time and complain about how money's changed football, how billionaires who don't care about the game have ruined football, etc., etc. And then comes along this story where AFC Wimbledon come uh, from the ashes, a Phoenix club, versing what used to be their own kind of team, in a sense. Um, in it, it used to, what used to be their, their own team and... One in the ninety fourth minute winner at home. It's really it's a it's a big kind of monumental moment, not monumental moment, but it's a moment that I think that it will be the best moment in that club's history, and I also think it'll be a moment that a lot of fans who went through the tribes and tribulations of the AFC Wimbledon of the um, Wimbledon FC drama turning into MK Dons and then moving into the at Phoenix Club and then moving on from there. Um. A lot of fans would be very um, uh, proud of their club at that stage, and also I guess it goes to show that anything can happen in football. Um, it's a very, very wholesome moment looking at the scenes after the game, especially when the goal goes in, it's pandemonium. And it's a very, very pure footballing moment that I think um, that I think a lot of people can kind of sit back and appreciate. You don't have to know, you don't have to support either club, you don't have to like either club. Don't ever have to have a connection to other club, but you can just sit back and appreciate the story, sit back and appreciate everything that's happened regarding both clubs. And yeah, I just think it's a it's a extremely kind of valuable and valuable moment in the footballing kind of sphere because we are all caught up in the economics of football and the politics of football when we can actually get down to the grassroots of football and 
having football almost overcome the economical power struggle and the political power struggle that football is kind of bred and initiated I think it's a pretty I think it's pretty cool I think it is pretty cool so good on Wimbledon they aren't having the the best of seasons they are just very much sitting in the middle of the road they are only four points off the playoffs in fairness so fingers crossed that they can um, potentially get it done but yeah um but yeah it was a uh, definitely a definitely a moment that I think a lot of football fans when they sort of uh, put a smile on their face especially those who are traditionalists and those who um, didn't like the way that MK Dons came about, um, I think a lot of people don't. It'll be interesting to see what the hardcore MK Dons fans who were Wimbledon fans felt about that result, what they feel about Wimbledon. I actually don't know. I probably should do a little bit more research on that in fairness. But um, no, it was definitely just a, an incident that I saw that I thought definitely needed appreciating on this podcast. So there you go. Okay. Um, I think that is all to, to cover. Um, I don't think anything else overly um, meaningful that I can remember that I can speak about happening. Um, Chelsea Bay leads straight to in the FA Cup as well, Conor Gallagher scored, which is great. Um, awesome. And Harlan scored like 17 goals against against Luton. Awesome again. Um, I'm going to take a quick break, come back, and let's have a rant about the A-League, shall we? Can't wait. Okay. 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 We're at home. And... Um, I've given this, I wanted to give this a bit of time because I don't know how far I'll go with it. I don't know how long I'll go with it. I don't know how short I'll go with it. But um, Australian football, or the A-League in particular, had has had a lot of, uh, quietly bubbling away a lot of old incident, a lot of old, um, how do I, issues have been bubbling away for a little while now, in particular with some active supporters. Um, and for those who know, you should know. And for those who don't know, um, go on Twitter and, and you should be... Like, the A-League released a statement for a reason. Um, the MacArthur... I think it, it's all started a little bit with MacArthur with their treatment, or with the treatment of their active support being very harsh and uh, over-policed. And then it kind of exploded on the weekend. Um, I think it all started on Saturday night with the Sydney Derby, um, somehow the RB... Okay, I mean, if you listen to Channel 9, the RBB managed to um, smuggle in an unauthorised banner that was about 223 metres long um, that covered basically half the stadium. Um, it, it was one of the more impressive, visually impressive bits of um, uh, TIFO and choreography in a little bit in, in a sense um, that the league has seen in a long time it was an awesome awesome banner right and obviously for a coordination to happen there it, it took a lot of coordination and a lot of authorization for that to happen according to town of nine it was unauthorized they snuck in a banner that was half the size of the stadium whatever when the some rbb members went to go back to the active area after displaying the banner around the ground they got barred from entering the RBB and they were police and then eventually the RBB walked out. Then the next day at Suncorp, the 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 den, the den, the Brisbane active support was heavily over police, people being arrested, people being abu- uh, physically assaulted by police um, on, on, a ma- on, on a mass scale, right? Nine News and other news outlets cover it um, and obviously they take the side of the police, obviously they take the side of the establishment and paint Australian football as the bad people and the thugs and the hooligans and the other language, which I'm not going to say, which I might end up saying just out of habit, but I'm not going to say now. Um, it, it, we're kind of on it. We're kind of on a knife and a on a knife edge here. We're, we're, we're we are on a knife edge here. Um, I don't know. We're, we're like we're on a knife edge here as a league. As a league, we are on a we are on on a really slippery slope because, and I wouldn't say almost identical because it's not, but a a very similar sequence of incidents happened in twenty fifteen. But the but the difference there is that in twenty fifteen the league was arguably at its peak. It was going through a very good period. The soccer is just won the Asian Cup on on home soil. We just had an awesome um, grand final, or was it, we're about to have an awesome grand final. Can't quite remember the timeline. Um, with uh, victory in Sydney, Amy Park being sold out the year after that, um, Adelaide Oval was sold out. The league was in a really, really good place. 
Um, and and so it, it couldn't whilst it couldn't afford that inc- that incident to happen, that incident happened and the league got through it right and still were able to overcome it and were in a strong place to a certain extent. The league is already on its knees from a lot of perspectives, right? Attendances, while for the most part have actually been quite good this season, from an external perspective, they aren't as good and it still doesn't get the reputation and the respect that it deserves. If the league is governed in a abhorrent, atrocious kind of... I don't even know what to describe it, but it's not one run well in the slightest. And I don't know... I, I, I don't know if the A-League and the APL approach this wrong. I don't think there is a way for them to overcome it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote the wise man by saying, F- fans, football fans can survive without football. Football cannot survive without its fans. And that rhetoric needs to be... The driving force behind the approach, the way the APL, the behind the APL, the way the the APL approaches, they've released a statement saying they're going to fucking cooperate with the authorities and governments and whatever and do whatever they need to do, which probably won't end up happening. Or like, if it does happen, won't end up coming to much for obvious reasons. Because why would it? Um, but the whether it's a government thing, whether it's a police thing, it's. The, the the stigma around this game in in this country is still there, and what frustrates me is that the stigma has roots of like racism in particular, right? And I mean, if you go onto any comment thread, if you go onto any comment thread about f- f- soccer violence in this country, you're going to see the word "wog" and you're going to see "ethnic" and you're going to see these these words slammed towards the people that are supposedly there. Um, and it, not only that, it's, it's for the most part, especially it was very, very prevalent at in Brisbane, it's teenagers, it's kids, it's children, it's young adults who are there to enjoy the game, who are there to support the community, who are there to support the A-League, who are there to just, for 90 minutes at once a week, just express their emotions and just go for it. And just be loud, be passionate, be partisan. And the police are stopping that. The police are kind of treating that like a crime, right? So being passion, passion is not a crime, right? And it feels like we are continuously being held back. And it feels like we are continuously being restricted into doing things that we know will help the sporting landscape and the country in general. But for whatever reason, the people that actually have power don't see that. Um, I do also find it quite funny that the two. Um, I do quite find it quite funny that the two the two states in which it happened in New South Wales and in Queensland. It seems like the NRL is is it might have happened might have started this week or is starting very very soon, which is quite a little bit of a stereotype or like a little bit of a funny coincidence and. I should probably know where Victory played this weekend. We play, um, we actually play away, thankfully, on on Saturday. But I mean, Victory away supporting Adelaide that could get ugly. And I mean, City play at home to Wellington. Um, City City play at home to Wellington, and um, with the AFL starting, of course, this weekend. I don't know what what could possibly happen there. Um, obviously, Western Sydney play at home as well, so it'd be interesting to see their response to that. But I'm sick and tired of. This I say I'm sick and tired. Like I'm fucking speaking for everyone. I think I am in, in a consensus, but I am like I feel like we're all sick and tired of this whole shit just happening again, again because it's it's targeted. It is targeted to this game. It is targeted to a certain group of people, and it is targeted to it is targeted to a certain group of people who, if given respect, and if given I think respect is the is the big word. Then it can change a lot. The perception around the game, the game itself, how big the game gets. Because it, it, I feel like I'm going around in circles because I've had this. I've spoken about this fucking countless times before. But it, it, it's fear. Is it fear? Is it racism? Is it is it stigma? Is it stereotypes? Is it is it negligence? Is it ignorance? What I don't know what it is. I don't know what the reason is. But it's happening again. So 
I feel like there I feel like there has to be a certain level of understanding and self awareness when it comes to the people that are doing this. They know what they're doing and they know why they're doing it and they know how they're doing it, rather than it just being complete uh, uh, ignorance. So that kind of fills me with a lot of dread because it's like, oh, yeah. Right, so you're fully self conscious about what you're doing. Okay, you're like you like you're self aware and you're conscious of what you're doing. I should say. Okay, great. Um, and you're conscious of the effect that it has. Okay, beautiful, perfect. That's that's great. Um, like I this Saturday, this Saturday night when when victory go to Adelaide, it could get really dicey. Um, and look, I'm not going to sit here and say that. I'm not going to sit here and say fucking football fans are, are completely um, innocent in everything, right? Because for there's there's bad eggs in every bunch of people, right? And I feel like football fans, for whatever reason, probably because of the partisan nature about it, probably do have a have a, a little bit more bad eggs than a lot of other sporting codes. However, I think that comes with a give and take, and that comes with look at the scenes. Look at the get. Look at the scenes before the derby on 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 um, on Saturday. Look at look at the look at the choreography. Look at the colours. Look at the tifos. Look at the no, list to the noise. It's it's this uh, almost you. Um, it's this atmosphere that doesn't only help a sport, but it helps a city. If your city can use this as an attraction, there you go. Like, I, how many people do you know that go to? London, and they might never never watch a soccer game before in their life, but they might pop into it to to a soccer game just because, right? It adds attraction to a city, and it adds a lot to a city that I feel like this country still hasn't quite grasped just how big it can get and just how attractive it can get for completely for people who don't support the game, and how much economic um, value can add to the game. The league. The league needs to stamp down hard on this. The league, the league needs to stamp down hard on this, and this could potentially make or break the connection that the league has with its supporters. And if they don't get it right, this is the final nail in the coffin because somehow, somehow they were given a second chance after the Sydney Grand Final debacle. And if they can't get it right this time, if they can't fully back in its fans this time, I think the relationship is broken beyond all repair and like i said like the like a wise man once said fans can survive without football football cannot survive without its fans and if you start and if we start seeing attendances drastically drop if we start seeing active supporters becoming non-existent this league will die it will die because it is on its last legs and like i said when it happened in 2015 we had the crutch of the game itself being in a good position this time around we do not have that same crutch it need, the league needs to be needs to show a fucking pair of balls for once in its life and back in its fans and back in its key stakeholders because you can have as you can have as many power brokers and as many rich people behind the scenes as as, as you want but if there's no fans going to the games if there's no if there's no people true footballing people investing into the game it will die it will die and I'm not saying just because of this, what happened this weekend, it's going to die. But if this continues, and if the league continues to sit back and not do anything about it and not help out its fans and not help the key stakeholders, then we could get drastic consequences. Drastic consequences. And it's it's scary. It's scary because I sit here and talk about it every week. So many people sit here and make a living off it every week. I mean, we saw the, the debacle and the, and the capitulation of Cape Up, which has, lost, which has cost so many people a lot of jobs. That's just one branch of the sector, in a sense. Imagine the whole sector being disappeared in a flash. So the APL have a lot of responsibility now. Um, yeah, I don't know where else to go with that. Um, I said it, I said it would be a rant, and it has turned into a rant. It, it's so disheartening. It's so saddening. It's so like, oh, we're here again. Great. Awesome. We're here again. I may as well. I could, I could just fucking do a monthly podcast for a, a three hours every month, speaking about the fucking issues that this country has with with football. Because it, 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 again, again, I could just cut and paste the thing that I've said two months ago and put it in here. The police brutality is one of the things that also fucked me off hard, hard because like these are kids you're pushing around. They're, they're innocent kids that you're pushing around. You're meant to be servants to society. You're not meant to fucking bully and intimidate and physically assault children. 
Like, fuck, man. <laughs> Come on. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And look, we're not completely innocent. We're not. We are not one hundred percent innocent from a totality perspective. I do believe that they may have their things may have happened on the on Brisbane fans' perspective, Western Sydney fans' perspective, whatever that have instigated this. Whatever. I don't think that's the case, but I'm willing to sit here and, and at least listen to the argument because I mean, fuck, guys have form. So I, I just don't know. I just, I. Just don't. I just don't know. Um, yeah, that's. I think. I think that's all for that. Um, I think that's all for that. Just. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll be sitting here running around in circles. Um, moving on to like actual A League chat. Obviously, victory lost. I don't want to speak about that because that's going to drive me even more insane. Um, Rolly Bonavassi scored, which is great, and Zizu scored as well, which is great. Um, Two shining lights in an otherwise very underwhelming game, and I think it's all but season done for victory, um, which is a shame. Which I, which I think is a big shame. Melbourne City lost. Um, I feel like they should be under a lot more scrutiny, scrutiny than what they actually are. Um, they have they have won once since December. They are they got smacked eight one not long ago. They were very very underwhelming against Macarthur, but with Bernardo scoring a brace. Um, for a team that has kind of been this literally Man City kind of copy-paste into the A-League for the last maybe half a decade, it's a little bit refreshing to see them suck. I don't think they'll make finals this year, which is a nice change from a victory sport perspective as also from a neutral fan perspective because um, it's good to see fresh faces at the top of the league. And also I, also, I also think that their rebuild won't take that long. Um, they might suck for the rest of this year. Maybe next year they might be a little bit underwhelming, but I think it won't be long until they just pump the money back in. They're going to spawn 17 youth players who are just Socceroos players all of a sudden. They'll be brought into the brought into the first team, and they'll be right. Um, they have been unlucky with injuries and managers and stuff like that this year, so I, I do get it. But um, yeah, I feel like there needs to be a lot more criticism on what, on, on, on moments in the, than there actually is because they actually have been quite poor for a for, large chunk of this season um which is surprising and i feel like a lot of people have just kind of they've flown under the radar with how bad they've been because they've got the credits in the bank of how good they've been over the last kind of half a decade so um maybe the 6-1 loss in the grand final hurt them a lot more than what we actually thought because yeah that um it's been, been very bad been very bad for melbourne city but yeah um is that all i think that i think that's all for i think that's all for um this episode of the Two Foot Cycle Podcast. Am I going to give a preview of what's happening in the week? Champions League football is back. Um, Bayern Munich should overcome the 1 0 deficit um, at home to Lazio, so I think they'll go through. PSG should comfortably go through. City and Real Madrid likewise. Um, Europa League round of 16 draw Benfica versus Rangers. There we go. So, you know what? I'll, think, I'll say Benfica win just because I'm wearing them. Wearing the, wearing the top. Um, Liverpool should at least win that game against Sparta Prague. Roma Brian will be a good game. Karabag versus Leverkusen. Leverkusen should get through comfortably. Um, AC versus Slavia Prague. That would be interesting. Freiburg versus West Ham will be a great game. Um, and Marseille Villarreal. United versus Everton. Early kickoff on the on the Saturday night Australian time. Um, victory versus Adelaide. So hopefully we can finally get a win for God's sake. Um, and then City versus Liverpool at two forty five, which will be, which is bound to be a title deciding game. So come and sit here and speak about that next week. Okay. Thank you all very much for watching another episode of the Two Foot Attacker podcast. Thank you all sticking around if you have. Um, if this is your first time here, make sure to subscribe, share it around. It does mean all more than the world. If this is your 100th time here, thank you for sticking around and tuning back in once again. Um, see you guys next week. Stay well, stay safe. Um, go victory. Goodbye. And go Chelsea, of course.